Good morning, everyone. We are back with the UK Space Agency again. We are here with Matt Archer. Would you care to introduce yourself to the viewers and what you do for the UK Space Agency, please? Yeah, more than happy to. Um, so uh, I'm the UK Space Agency Program Director for UK Launch. Um, so absolutely everything uh, regarding kind of launching from the UK comes to me. Uh, which is kind of a great privilege and um, yeah, very exciting program. Well, that it sounds like it to me as well. I really appreciate you joining us today. So, I mean, can you give me an first of all an overview as to I mean, it's uh, you know your your job description is um, you know commercial launch that sort of thing. What are you doing to promote um, uh, private uh, space launch in this country? So, the UK Space Agency. Uh, set up its spaceflight program back in 2017 um, and we've taken a, a relatively unique approach compared to other uh, other nations across the globe where we are not um, it's not state funding kind of the infrastructure um, so the spaceports that are being made available across the UK are done so via private funding um, our, our sort of grant funding that we awarded in 2018 and 2019 was largely to support five major projects, so bringing three different launch companies to the UK's uh, space sector, um, developing an orbital manoeuvring vehicle to so help deploy satellites in specific orbits, um, and a small grant to support the Highlands Islands Enterprise in developing um, Space Hub Sutherland and kind of wider space uh, sector in Scotland. Um, so for us, our role has been uh, acting as kind of project integrators, um, but also kind of enabling that funding to de-risk kind of the creation of a new market. So very exciting times for the UK. Very much so. So I had an opportunity to visit uh, Saxavord for several days, actually, not that long ago. Um, what have you guys done to uh, promote them, for example, and what they've been attempting to accomplish? It's a really good good example. So. Um, they are, uh, as you say, creating a three-pad spaceport up in the Shetland Isles and making kind of great progress. Um, support from the government kind of comes in a number of forms, so not necessarily financial directly to the spaceport, um, but whether that's supporting them in developing the underpinning regulations that we had to put in place, um, so making sure that we can conduct safe launch, given it's the first time uh, we will have ever launched from UK soil. Um, but equally supporting Lockheed Martin, who are bringing uh, ABL space systems and their rockets to Saxavord. So creating, um, if you like, that industrial demand and kickstarting the interest in Saxavord as a location uh, to launch from. Um, and again, that's where we've spent £13 million pounds worth of taxpayers' money to, to bring across um, that capability, which would be able to lift up to a a one ton payload into into low earth orbit so yeah for us supporting them as best we can in developing their business and um, noting that they're privately funded for the spaceport um, but absolutely keen to see the success of the spaceport and all the local businesses that support it now when you say when you give me figures like 13 million pounds to an american observer that i mean we might be able to send a model rocket up for that so um how is it that you are accomplishing what something which i'm regard and i don't know how i get this but i predict that Saks of Ward will be the second busiest spaceport in the world if you do accomplish 30 launches per year out of there as they talk about um, how is that being done on such a small budget? So uh, this is so uh, part of the, the program was about how we co-fund with industry. So the funding that I mentioned of thirteen and a half million pounds, around fifteen fifteen million dollars or so, um, is about supporting Lockheed Martin's own investment and that of ABL to create the capability they need to be able to operate from the UK. Um, I think for us, the, the reason that they see the opportunity to invest in Saks Abroad um, and kind of operating from that location is the UK's got a unique position in being able to access um, northerly kind of and polar sun-synchronous orbits. Um, it's a benefit of our geography and 
certainly for markets like telecoms and earth observation which are both real growth segments actually there's a there's a big commercial driver to launch um, and a real opportunity for the UK so they've seen uh, the potential value for them as a commercial enterprise and supported the investment alongside um, so yeah it, it's a good way of us working with industry and um, and providing taxpayer funding where um, there are good value for money outcomes and it supports you know, for Saks of Ord probably in excess of 200 jobs by the time the spaceport and the local businesses are there um, so yeah really exciting to see sort of regenerative projects in uh, in the kind of Shetland Isles, which I know have struggled of late. So you guys are trying to accomplish, you know, an amazingly diverse collection of things. Develop commercial space flight, um, you know, build solar power stations, uh, you know, clean up space debris, take the lead on that. I, I read that the UK is investing a hundred million pounds over the next three years in space debris mitigation. All of these sorts of things, and yet your funding is one third that of France, for example. So, I mean, how, you know, do, do, do you feel that this list of tasks is too much for your budget? Do you foresee that your budget will increase in the future, perhaps to mirror what France is doing, for example? So, uh, so different, different objectives, um, but yes, yeah, so you're quite right. So, um, our funding has grown over the last few years substantially and Obviously, I can't speak to the future. That's a matter for kind of government spending in due course. But um, it's fair to say that the government is increasing its expenditure on research and development. And for us, that includes launch, um, as well as a number of other space topics. Um, for the French, I think it's worth bearing in mind that their space program is distorted heavily by Ariane launches. Um, so providing a heavy launch capability and operating out of uh, French Guyana. Um, so again, they're funding very different capabilities. And for the UK, we get our um, assured access to launch through, um, in terms of heavy launch, either through European capability from French Guyana or uh, Americans from a number of spaceports in the US. So we, there, are, there are choices about where we're choosing to invest um, and where we see kind of the UK being world leaders um, in different technologies. So as you said, debris removal, we've got uh, some of the world leading companies here in the UK developing both technologies and kind of manufacturing capability to be able to support a growth segment going forward. Um, so for now our, our budget, I'm not going to say that we wouldn't like more, wouldn't everybody, um, but we're confident that we'll deliver a programme which boosts the space sector and continues its kind of rapid growth here in the UK. Very diplomatically put, sir, um, and and I appreciate that. Of course, um, I I tend to go out uh, in the public and advocate for greater funding um, for what I think you guys some some very very worthwhile things. Let me ask you a question that I've asked to many people now, both on both from Sierra Space uh, in the U.S. and on this side of the pond at Spaceport Cornwall. Um, Spaceport Cornwall has developed, of course, a relationship with Sierra Space and the Dream Chaser, uh, not only to just let it land there, but also satellite integration, that sort of thing. Sierra Space has expressed a desire um, to make Dream Chaser part of Europe's overall launch strategy to maybe send a Dream Chaser up on an Ariane 5 and have it land at Spaceport Cornwall and then when it's human rated in 2026, you know, to give Europe a human, human space flight program. Do you, I mean, obviously these are grandiose things, but do you, do you foresee that something like that could ever happen? I, yes, I do. Um, so the, and that's part, partly the investment we've made in, in Spaceport Cornwall, it is around developing the capability, not only for it to conduct kind of air-based launch for companies like Virgin Orbit, um, or, or equally kind of the Pegasus rocket from Northrop Grumman, um, that, that's a kind of foundational capability that actually says you know how to operate and conduct safe space missions whether that's as you say in the in the interim period whether Dream Chaser lands at Spaceport Cornwall I'm keen to see uh, see that opportunity come to fruition I know that certainly Spaceport Cornwall are as well um, human spaceflight 
we so the UK opts to fund its human exploration programs through the European Space Agency um, and again I know that they will be looking at uh, both the, using kind of Ariane launches in future um, and again when Dream Chaser develops that capability to do human space flight I imagine it will be uh, kind of game changing in terms of how uh, those programs can access space so yes I would love to see uh, a mission that returns astronauts to, to Cornwall Fantastic. Um, so tell me, what sort of uh, other programs do you have in place to uh, fund these up-and-coming um, launch providers? For example, Skyrora, who has received some funding from you folks, and yep. uh, and Black Arrow, who I know is seeking funding from you. Um, what criteria do you use, and uh, and you know, uh, that how do you choose launch providers to support? So we. I'll speak to where we started the program and then come to, I suppose, what we're doing now. So when we started the program, um, there was a deliberate choice by the then um, team in place that we wanted to have a mix of growing UK capability. So uh, companies like Orbex and Skyrora both received funding from uh, from the UK government on that basis is to develop kind of a, a homegrown capability. Um, but equally, we wanted to have a diverse market that had established players. So um, Virgin Orbit, again, was developing at the time and was a kind of confident technology uh, that we sought to bring across and certainly looking forward to its first launch in the coming weeks. Um, and equally, lucky Martin bringing across uh, ABL space systems. So we're looking to make the UK an attractive uh, launch destination uh, both for companies here in the UK and for those that um, are mainly belt based elsewhere, but actually the commercial demand would enable them to launch from the UK. Our, our future plans for the programme, so we've got £108 million pounds worth of launch spending set aside for the next three years. Um, we're looking to make sure that we boost kind of UK capability. Um, and that doesn't mean to say that they have to be based here in the UK, but we're looking to kind of grow jobs and industry here in the UK so whether it's a US company that wants to kind of inward invest um, or a UK company looking to grow like Black Arrow or B2 Space um, or Skyrora it's working out where are the partnerships that we can develop um, noting that HMG can't fund uh, everything to kind of complete its development cycle but actually where can we have catalyzed private sector investment to give the biggest effect um, on the space sector and help those companies realise that growth path. Um, so that's some, that's something that we continue to look at for all of those companies is how best can we support them um, and what's the best way to use taxpayer funding to do that. Thanks. Um, another question, uh, we're getting kind of towards the end here. Um, I've got just a couple of more. First of all, today I intend to go to the Science Museum and uh, do some man-on-the-street interviews with people who are coming out people who are, have an interest in science to first of all find out if they even know what's going on in Cornwall. I suspect based on everybody else I've spoken to that they're probably most people won't. And how do we get you know people engaged in that? What can journalists like myself do to help get the word out on what's being done and to get um, British people excited about space flight? It's a really important part of um what we collectively in the space sector need to do, which is shouting about our achievements in many ways, but actually it's about recognizing that the reason we, we build these capabilities is not just for today's generation, but it's for tomorrow's generation. Um, and I, I was very privileged recently that we were able to have a replica of the Launcher One rocket parked outside the Science Museum. And you're quite right, the, the awareness of of launch is is improving like the more we talk about it and the more that it kind of comes to having a first launch that will become like real for many people and we, we know that we know that until you've done it and you can demonstrate it people don't necessarily kind of know what's happening um, so for us it's about making sure that we we kind of run the build up to that first launch and kind of cover it as best we can and just kind of talk about all the benefits that it will bring not just to the local community but to, to kind of those that want to get into the space sector, whether that's future designers, like architects, um, 
manufacturing kind of specialists, engineers, scientists. There's a whole bunch of jobs that the space sector desperately needs kind of new talent. And if you're a youngster today, what better way to inspire them than with a with a launch from the UK? So um, yeah, really looking forward to doing more of that activity. Well, I'm looking forward to helping you out any way I can. Um, I guess sort of to close at this point, what are the upcoming projects that I may not have heard about? What are the things that you are the most excited about coming up? Um, most excited coming up. So from the agency's perspective, I'm, I'm sort of personally really excited about our active debris removal missions. I think it's a it's a critical part of maintaining space um, and that it can be usable not just for uh, kind of the coming years but for the coming generations. It's really important that we learn to look after our space environment as we do the planet. Um, and, and kind of beyond that, um, certainly um, the next kind of mission that I'm particularly kind of keeping an eye on is TRUTHS. So it's an Earth observation mission the UK is leading uh, over the coming um, decade to invest in climate technology that will give us much more accurate predictions uh, of climate change and enable us to respond uh, much faster to kind of changing kind of conditions on Earth. So, uh, yeah, a really important climate-based mission that will support um, lots of countries around the world. So, yeah, that, that's kind of my my favourite two at the moment. Okay, I'm afraid I lied. In order to follow up, I've got one more question about space debris removal. For one thing, it's the most uh, popular interview that I've done thus far um, here in Britain. Um, so you've, you've got you know the, this initial competition going for a few million pounds um, that either is going to Astroscale or I think Clear, to, clear Space. Um, now, once we have a winner in there, there's also talk of 100 million pounds being invested overall. Do you feel that uh, the UK Space Agency and whoever wins this competition is going to actually be able to have a real impact? Do you think with this investment you'll be able to set an example to the world as to how we can get rid of this problem? Yes, I, I think I think we will. I, I think that's the bit where you, with all things that you know, are hard to do, they require effort. And, and that's the bit where the UK is is showing its leadership in that space, whether that is um, its ongoing commitment to not testing anti-satellite weapons, um, or equally kind of the work we're doing with Astroscale or others, is about testing a technology that says, you know, when, you, when you first start this process, they tend to be expensive, they tend to be challenging, but once you've done it and you've proven the capability and you can invest in it, you suddenly start to open up um, not just kind of um, economies of scale, so it makes it cheaper and easier to do, but it shows others actually, for a relatively small investment, we can start to think about, well, if we've got really big bits of debris and they occupy orbits that are commercially valuable, actually you create an incentive um, for others to fund those missions. So that's what we're trying to do. I think it's a really important part of demonstrating our long-term commitment to the space environment um, and the activity will generate kind of export opportunities. So whether it's Astro Scale selling that technology to others to clean up space, I think it's a great, great opportunity for us to kind of show world leadership. Well, I appreciate that in particular, the fact that you are taking leadership with two incredibly important things, space debris and also what I regard the, as the ultimate in green energy, space solar powered. So I appreciate everything you folks are doing and thank you so much for your time today, sir. Thank you. And I think this interview kind of encapsulates the reason that I enjoy UK space flight as much as I do, because organizations like the UK Space Agency are accomplishing so much with a lot less money than Jeff Bezos is spending on Blue Origin, for example. That's a remarkable example that should be mirrored and followed by other space agencies around the world. Thanks so much to the UK Space Agency and to Mr. 
Mr. Archer. Please like, please subscribe, and please check the description for various ways to keep me bringing unique content like this to you from places around the world. And until every agency on the planet makes such effective use of their funding, I urge all of you to stay angry about space. Oh, <laughs>